Good afternoon and welcome to, whoops, glasses, old man. <clears throat> welcome to When Governments Attack, State-Sponsored Malware Attacks Against Activists, Lawyers, and Journalists. You are in Mandalay EF, and our talk today is presented by Cooper Quinton and Eva Galperin. Just a couple of notes before we get started. First of all, the business hall is located in Bayside AB and closes fairly shortly after this talk, if I recall correctly. Black Hat Arsenal is still going in the Palm Foyer on level three, and their uh, Arsenal reception is at 1700 today. If you haven't picked up merchandise that you want from the Black Hat uh, bookstore or the um, swag store, you'll need to do that today too, as it closes at six. And finally, the Cali Linux Lab is in Mandalay Bay A. Uh, as always, please make sure that your phones are on silent, because that's what we want to hear from them, nothing. And with that, I will turn it over to Cooper and Eva. Hi there. Welcome to When Governments Attack, also known as I got a letter from the government the other day because I couldn't resist a public enemy reference. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, research that uh, me and my colleagues have been doing for approximately the last year. Uh, so there's me up there. Uh, my name is Eva Galperin. I'm a global policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I'm Cooper Quinton. I'm a staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and a security researcher. Uh, we did this work with uh, Morgan Marquis Bois, who is director of security at First Look, and uh, Claudio Guerrieri, uh, who is a staff technologist at Amnesty International, uh, who is not giving this talk because he had to go give another talk about state sponsored malware in Iran. So, how many of you here know what the EFF is? A lot of hands go up, a lot of hands go up. That's good, but not quite everybody. So we're going to go through a really quick explanation of who we are and what we do. So I think the best way to explain what EFF is is through the work that we do. Last year, our colleague Jeremy Galula did some tests which proved that T-Mobile was throttling uh, video traffic for all of their customers that had the binge on service enabled. Uh, we did tests, we wrote a blog post, and we got on uh, Twitter to ask John Legere about this. And he had this lovely response for us. Uh, I want to note that I censored the cuss word here. He did not censor himself, which is great. It's not every day you get a CEO of a major telecom company to cuss you out on the internet. So I want to answer these questions, because I think that they're important. The first question is, who the expletive deleted are you anyway, EFF? Well, could have looked at our Twitter profile. Let me Google that for you. He could have asked a hacker, but that's okay. We're happy to let him know who we are. We're a nonprofit that's been around for 25 years, and our mission is to make sure that when you get online, your rights come with you. We do this through a combination of work. Uh, we're probably most famous for our legal work, including our many lawsuits against the NSA, and our coder's rights project, which makes sure that security researchers don't get in trouble for the work that they do. We also have an amazing activism team, which does great things like, along with Greenpeace, fly a blimp over the NSA data center in Utah, letting everybody know that illegal spying was happening below. So in case they were trying to keep that massive building a secret, that was no longer a problem for them. Uh, we also work to reform the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which you're all probably familiar with. Uh, we think that it's draconian and overreaching and puts too many people in jail for far too long. We also have an international team. We also have an international team. The uh, internet is global, and so are the threats to it. Uh, one of my sort of latest projects on the international team has been working on uh, sort of opposition to the latest changes to the Vosnar arrangement. Um, as a result of the kind of uh, security research that we've done regarding threats to uh, journalists and activists, uh, human rights defenders became very concerned about the sale of uh, surveillance software to authoritarian regimes. And uh, European nations uh, who are part of the Vosnar arrangement, which, uh, who here knows what the Vosnar arrangement is? 
far fewer people than EFF. So I will explain really quick. Uh, the Boston Arrangement is not a, not a treaty. So we're not looking at like TPP or ACTA or anything like that. Uh, it is a voluntary arrangement of 40 something countries. And usually it governs the export of weapons and uh, the stuff that you need in order to make weapons. In 2013, uh, the, some European countries proposed changes to the Bosnar arrangement, which expanded it to include the export of uh, certain types of surveillance software. Uh, and then it was up to the countries to come up with their own implementations for how that was going to go. Uh, in 2013, when the US first unveiled their proposed uh, implementation, it was cuckoo bananas. Uh, not only did they want to uh, have all kinds of um, sort of uh, limits on the export of what we consider to be perfectly innocent software, but they also wanted to have limits on the export of software that could be used to uh, find or in some way weaponize uh, zero-day vulnerabilities, which I'm fairly certain everybody in this room uh, could say means a whole lot of stuff that we use every day. Uh, we also have a number of technology projects, and this is the team that I'm on. We have Privacy Badger, which is a browser add-on to block the things that try to spy on your reading habits online. We have HTTPS Everywhere, which makes sure that your connection to websites is encrypted whenever possible. And we have CertBot and Let's Encrypt, which is our free certificate authority and client to make ins getting and installing a certificate as painless as possible. And I think that we are... we've issued over five million certificates now with that. So his second question, why are you stirring up so much trouble? Well, because it's our job. It's literally what we get paid to do, and it's, it's great. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, who pays us? We're lucky enough to be paid by our over 25,000 amazing dues-paying members, many of which are here. Who, who here is an EFF member? I see some hands. Awesome, thank you. Um, so our members took to Twitter to let John Legere know this fact and let him know that if they were forced to choose between T-Mobile and EFF, they would happily choose T-Mobile any day, or EFF, <laughs> any day. Uh, John Legere quickly backpedaled after seeing this and admitted that he does know who EFF is and he's sure that we do a lot of great things. So at least we agree on one thing. Also on the list of works uh, that we do, uh, we have spent a lot of time uh, worrying about the safety of activists and uh, journalists online, which has led to many years of the study of uh, targeted malware attacks. Uh, this includes uh, work that we have done in Vietnam. Uh, admittedly, this is some of the easiest uh, malware analysis that I've ever been involved in because the government of, uh, of Vietnam sent me a phishing email with malware attached to it. Uh, so uh, me and my colleague immediately um, uh, reversed it and wrote up a report and linked it to a bunch of other attacks on other, uh, on other Vietnamese activists. Uh, we've also done about two and a half uh, years worth of work on uh, malware, which was being spread by hackers allied with uh, Bashir al-Assad in Syria, especially at the beginning of the Syrian civil war. Um, additionally, we've spent a lot of time worried about Ethiopia, which has a sort of very closed uh, media environment and spends a lot of time jailing its bloggers. Uh, among other things, uh, we were able to show that the Ethiopian government had uh, used uh, FinFisher's software to spy on a uh, Ethiopian uh, who was living in Silver Springs, Maryland. Uh, and was uh, doing his uh, activism under the name Kidane. Uh, our uh, forensics uh, friends were able to show that the uh, FinFisher spyware was used to spy on his uh, Google searches and also on his uh, Skype calls. 
and our legal team quite rightfully believes that this is a violation of the wiretapping statute in the US. Uh, and so uh, we are representing Mr. Kidane in his lawsuit against the government of Ethiopia. And uh, it is very much our opinion that uh, if you spy on somebody in the United States and you are breaking US law, we should be able to take you to US court. Uh, finally, I'm not the only person at EFF who gets targeted with uh, state-sponsored malware. I'm not special. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jillian C. York, is uh, the International Director of Freedom of Expression. Uh, earlier this year, she received a spear phishing email that purported to be from a journalist. It contained an attachment, uh, presumably having to do with some work that uh, he wanted her to look at. Uh, my colleague has spent several years sitting next to me at EFF, and so she does not open strange attachments, and asked the gentleman to please copy and paste his request into the body of the email. Uh, in addition to refusing to do this, the journalist began to call her. He called her and badgered her to open the, the attachment. And in the end, when she stopped answering his calls, uh, he called an additional 32 times. Uh, our friends at Citizen Lab uh, took a look at this very interesting attachment and were able to link this to a campaign that was targeting uh, opponents of uh, the government of Iran. Um, we have also run into an actor, which you may have heard of, named Fancy Bear. Earlier last year, uh, some friends of ours on the Google security team let us know that they had discovered a domain used in a watering hole attack. And the domain was electronicfrontierfoundation.org which was of concern to us. We looked into it and discovered that it was a part of the Pondstorm campaign, which had been linked to Fancy Bear and APT28 um, by researchers at Trend Micro earlier that year. Um, we did the research and wrote a report, and we were able to recover electronicfrontierfoundation.org. We still don't know who the targets were for this attack, but it doesn't appear to have been any of us. And so this brings us to Operation Mantle, uh, or I got a letter from the government. So there are a couple of things you're going to need to know on background before we can get down into the weeds on, the, on this campaign. And the first is the location of Kazakhstan on the map. Who here, prior to this slide, could locate Kazakhstan on a map? You people are lying, mostly. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, there's Kazakhstan, neatly situated between Russia and China, next to Uzbekistan, bordering Turkmenistan, near Kyrgyzstan, and all of the other exciting stands that most people are not able to locate when they have an American ge uh, sort of education in geography. Who here can name the president of Kazakhstan? Okay, a couple people. At least people are staying honest. Not so bad. Uh, so this gentleman right here is Nusrtan Nazarbayev. Uh, he is the first current and only president of Kazakhstan, which should give you some idea of where they are in the area of free elections. Uh, he is shown here uh, presumably just about to take his shirt off so that he can match this guy. <laughs> they're great friends. I'm assuming that they're just riding horses together right now. Uh, additionally, just in, uh, in case uh, taking my word for it was not enough, uh, here is a 2015 Freedom House report uh, describing the uh, freedom situation in Kazakhstan, uh, which is essentially there's not a lot of it. Uh, they have rated uh, the Kazakhstan's press status as not free. Uh, they've given the press freedom score of 85, the worst being 100. Uh, the legal environment is 29, 30 being the worst. The political environment as 33, 40 being the worst. And the economic environment is 23, 30 being the worst. And they're probably saved from an even worse score only by the fact that they're an oil-rich country. You may also recognize uh, Kazakhstan in the news from this hilarious move. Um, so in uh, December of 2015, uh, Kazakhstan's 
only telco announced that there had been a government order mandating all citizens of Kazakhstan to install a government-issued root cert on their computers so that they could man in the middle all SSL traffic. Uh, Kazakhstan then promised that this would be starting in January and they would be happy to give people lessons in how to install these root certs and everything was going to be okay. Uh, this caused an enormous outcry in the tech community because clearly this is bogus. And uh, a couple of days later, the telecom took the uh, decree down. But people were still uh, very nervous that uh, Kazakhstan might try something like this. Uh, they need not have worried because the actual result was nothing. Nothing happened. You may also recognize Kazakhstan from this map. Uh, this is a 2015 Citizen Lab map of FinFisher spyware clients, people who have bought surveillance uh, spyware from uh, FinFisher, uh, also known as Gamma International. Uh, I'm not going to go into the structures of these companies because it's actually very dull. Um, in a belt and suspenders approach to spying, uh, you may also recognize them from this map from 2014, detailing uh, the countries which have purchased uh, hacking teams RCS spyware. So I guess if one doesn't work, they'll just break out the other. Uh, the next person that you're going to need to be familiar with, there will be a test, is uh, Mukhtar Ablazov. Uh, this guy right here is the co-founder of the Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, a party opposed to the authoritarian rule of uh, President Nasrotan Nazarbayev. Um, I was chosen for my ability to actually pronounce these words on stage. Um, Ablyazov is currently fighting extradition from France, where he lives in exile, uh, to Nazarbayev-allied uh, Russia. This is Alma, Alma Shalabayeva, uh, Ablyazov's wife. I told you this was going to get difficult. Um, in May of 2013, uh, Ablazov's wife uh, and their six-year-old daughter, Alua, uh, were taken into custody by Italian police and forcibly deported in spite of the fact that they had both British and European residence permits. Uh, after about 72 hours, uh, they were put on a private jet hired by the embassy of Kazakhstan uh, and taken to Almaty, which is uh, Kazakhstan's capital. Uh, Ablyazov and his supporters have characterized this move as a kidnapping and political hostage taking uh, ordered by uh, the president. Next person you're going to have to get to know, just in case this isn't uh, all quite scary enough, uh, is uh, Irina Petrushova. Uh, Irina Petrushova is uh, the founder and editor of Respublika, uh, which is uh, an independent uh, newspaper which covers Kazakhstan, and she's been doing this since approximately 2001. Uh, it's been a very eventful or so, 15 years for Irina. Uh, the paper is very hard hitting. Uh, they wrote about financial scandals and uh, rampant nepotism and cronyism. Uh, scandals exposed by the paper include the granting of oil rights to one of Nazarbayev's relatives, uh, the disappearance of funds for an airport in the capital, Almaty, uh, the Kazakh police forcing tourists off a plane so Nazarbayev's daughter could fly alone. I assume she's Marlene Dietrich. Uh, Respublika's most notable story was an expose which revealed that Nazarbayev had stashed, and I am not kidding, one billion dollars of the state's oil revenues in a Swiss bank account. Uh, the government stated that this was an emergency fund that they were going to use to rescue the national economy in 1998. Um, it ain't easy being Irina. Uh, on one occasion, a decapitated dog was hung from the Respublica building with a screwdriver sticking into its side and a note reading, there will be no next time. Uh, in, in the interest of, uh, of not wasting the dog, the, dog was uh, the head of the dog was left outside of Petrushova's home. Also with a note. This is a skull. This is not the skull that was left outside of uh, the office of one of Irina's publishers, but I imagine it is actually rather similar, and the whole idea was to try to convince the publishers that, uh, that they should not be printing her newspaper. Uh, things got worse for Irina. Uh, three days after the dog incident, uh, the paper's offices were firebombed and burned to the ground. Uh, 
that July, uh, Petrusheva was given an 18-month jail sentence on tax charges. Uh, she didn't serve any time because the judge ruled that the case fell under an amnesty. But uh, Petrusheva and, uh, and her brother, Alexander, finally got the point and decided to move to Russia. It is a bad sign when you decide that Russia is a marginally safer placer than when you are now, a phrase which applies to other political situations. Um, Things did not stop getting bad for Respublika. Uh, as you can see here in 2009, uh, the government uh, seized the entire uh, paper's weekly print run. Uh, this led to a sort of game of cat and mouse between uh, the newspaper and the government in which they kept changing the name of the paper and kept changing publishers in an uh, effort to continue to get the news out. This here is the Asandi Times, which is also Respublica. I think that this was one of the very last names that Respublica had uh, before they stopped printing altogether and just went uh, entirely digital. Next thing you're going to need to know about is this site right here, Kaza Word. I am not going to require you all to learn Russian to, to, to read any of this, um, but uh, starting in August of 2014, uh, this website went up and they started posting uh, caches of leaked documents. Uh, one particularly interesting cache of leaks was uh, somewhere between three and 400 emails uh, between the government of Kazakhstan and these guys right here. This is Arcanum Global Intelligence. And the emails indicate that uh, the government of Kazakhstan had hired Arcanum Global Intelligence to be their eyes and ears inside of uh, Geneva, Switzerland, uh, where uh, Abliyev's, uh, some of Abliyev's family was living and currently involved in lengthy litigation with them. And uh, part of Arcanum's job was to uh, carry out a spying and data extraction campaign. So, like good journalists, uh, Irina and Respublika started uh, actually reporting on this very tasty cache of emails. Uh, the government of Kazakhstan was not amused, and they deployed their third, fourth, maybe fifth scariest tactic, uh, which is to say that they didn't firebomb anything, but they did send out the lawyers. Uh, they launched a lawsuit in which they alleged that, uh, that Irina and her brother were actually behind the Casa Word uh, website, that they had stolen the emails, and they tried to get a U.S. court to censor uh, the Respublica website uh, in order to prevent them from publishing information about the allegedly stolen emails. Uh, this, incidentally, is how EFF, uh, sort of got its foot into this case. Uh, we were Respublica's lawyers in the state of New York. And around this time, Irina and Alexander started getting some weird emails. So this brings us to the malware portion of our show. And we're unveiling Operation Mantle. Um, so Irina and her brother, Alexander Petrushov, who is also the co-editor of Respublica, started receiving some suspicious looking emails. Uh, this is a spear phishing email which was sent to Alexander Petrushev, and it claims to be from a lawyer named Eric Rishat. Interestingly, the email it claims to be a legal invoice, but it is addressed to Bolat Atabayev, who is another Kazakh dissident and theater director who was also targeted in this campaign. Uh, the email has a PDF attachment which, when opened, displays this blurry image and a JavaScript pop-up which instructs the user that they need to download a new version of Adobe Reader if they want to be able to read this invoice. Of course, that's not what's actually downloaded. What's actually downloaded is some malware. Surprise, surprise. Uh, we discovered two families of, or we observed two families of malware uh, as we were researching these actors. The first is known as JRAT, or known as Jackspot in the security community. Um, JRAT is a Java-based commodity rat. It's available for $40 in Bitcoin online, um, very cheap. Uh, it is multi-platform, able to target Mac, Windows, Linux, and even Solaris environments in case you're trying to hack a 90s era system administrator. Um, <laughs> 
It has a plugin-based architecture and an open API in case the plugins that are available aren't enough for you. So this is an example of the JRAT control panel where the attacker can list all of their victims uh, and see some pertinent information about their computers. Uh, and this is an example of JRAT's remote screen viewer uh, on a victim with OS X installed. Uh, and this is the control panel for any given computer which displays some information like how much memory is free, so on and so on. JRAT has some other features as well. Uh, you can see a process list, you can edit registry entries if it's a Windows victim, uh, and you can manage the remote file system. It also has a number of plugins, as I mentioned, uh, such as turning on the remote webcam, disabling the indicator light because we don't want people to know they're being watched, um, password recovery, a keylogger, uh, reverse SOX proxy, and of course, remote shell, and a chat program in case you want to taunt or harass your victim. Uh, JRAD also has some interesting anti-analysis features. The bytecode is obfuscated with Zendix Classmaster, or ZKM, which is a commercial JavaScript, Java obfuscator. Uh, it uses uh, X, random XOR on the strings in the program, renames class files, splits up classes, renames functions. Um, it also inserts some bytecode which makes decompilation harder. Uh, there's also an encrypted config file. The config file is encrypted using ABS in CBC mode. The key and the IV are stored in the metadata for the config file, which is stored in the jar file. Uh, in the extra field for the config file, there are 32 bytes. The first 16 bytes are the IV, and the second 16 bytes are the key to decrypt the config file. Once you decrypt the config file, you get the command and control servers, the passwords for those servers, and the uh, name of the operation. Um, it also has features to detect some virtualization and shut itself down if it sees it's running in a virtualized environment. We also observed another malware family called Banduk. Uh, Banduk is another off-the-shelf commodity rat. Um, it has con been continuously developed over a number of years, and I think it's a little more popular than JRAT. It only targets Windows. Uh, and we're not sure why they used both families, but maybe they realized that some of their victims were not using Windows. Um, it's also modular and has a number of similar plugins, including uh, starting a shell, recording uh, web with the webcam, disabling the light, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the interesting things about Banduke is that it, when it's implanted, it's implanted without any of the plugins enabled. The plugins only get added after Banduke contacts the CNC server and presumably after the attacker has had a chance to verify uh, that this is the correct victim. So we want to think about this. Why are these attackers using off-the-shelf malware? And we don't think this is crimeware based on the indicators that we have. So the advantages of this are that it's cheap, uh, it's featureful, and there are fewer artifacts to hang attribution on. You don't get any programming styles. You don't get any um, uh, file system indicators. Uh, the cons are that it can be detected by antivirus and other security products, so it wouldn't be suited for somebody with advanced defenses. Fortunately for the attackers in this case, activists and lawyers aren't known for having advanced security defenses. So we can't look at indicators in the malware, so instead we took a look at this command and control servers. Uh, we found about eight different domains pointing at, were hosted on around three different command and control servers. Uh, they were Windows servers running XAMPP, which is the Windows version of Apache, PHP, and MySQL. Um, and they don't appear to be shared hosts based on the fact that all of the domains we could find on these servers all pointed to the same document root. Um, but just because they're not shared hosts doesn't mean they're busy, or doesn't mean they're not busy. Uh, we found a number of open ports running, most of which were ports for victims to connect to the command and control server. Um, but we also found a number of open directories. So that's pretty interesting. We decided to take a look at that. 
What we found were a number of other targets unrelated to Kazakhstan. We found um, files from a Vietnamese cigarette company. We found encrypted password files from other victims. Uh, we found cell phone logs from Android phones indicating the presence of an Android rat, which we were unfortunately unable to find a sample of. Uh, we also found a number of web-based rat control panels under different code names. So this leads us to believe that this is an attacker who has many different campaigns going on at once uh, and is potentially an actor that is for hire, um, probably not somebody who is only concerned with the dissidents of Kazakhstan. So, of course, as always, we want to do attribution because attribution is fun. But as Eva will tell you, and as any security researcher will tell you... Please join me for a chorus of attribution is hard. <laughs> now, one of the problems with doing this sort of uh, nation-state malware research is that it is very rare that you're going to get solid attribution. Uh, you're not going to wind up with video of some guy twirling his mustache, laughing maniacally, talking about how great it is that the government of Kazakhstan has paid him to hack these, uh, these journalists and dissidents. So let's talk a little bit about what we do have, which is evidence that's considerably more circumstantial. And I think that we should probably start with the links to Kazakhstan. Talk a little bit about the reasons why we think it's these guys. Uh, the primary reason is uh, definitely that Kazakhstan is the common thread between these targets. Uh, we have tracked uh, dozens and dozens of targets as part of this campaign. Uh, nearly all of them have been uh, high-profile dissidents, uh, family members, or uh, people who are involved in sort of legal or press support to dissidents and family members. Uh, furthermore, uh, you can see that uh, nearly all of these people are involved in legal disputes against the government of Kazakhstan because it turns out that Kazakhstan is extra super litigious. Uh, this is actually one of the, the primary ways in which they kind of hassle their dissidents. Um, because most of their dissidents are in exile and are living abroad, uh, Kazakhstan's uh, ability to, uh, you know, send dead dogs to their, to their office is a little bit limited, uh, and so mostly now they do battle using lawyers. Where are we now? <laughs> okay. Um, we've also taken a look at the spear phishing that was uh, crafted. Uh, it appears to have been targeted solely to appeal to people who are interested in matters relating to Kazakhstan. Uh, they have titles like Information KZ, Press Document KZ, Kazakh, News of importance. Uh, there was even a document purporting to be a Human Rights Watch report on the misdeeds of the president of Kazakhstan. So that gives us a fairly good idea of, uh, of who it is that they're after. Uh, and finally, there are the emails published by Kazaword, which talk extensively about the role of Arcanum Global Intelligence, which we can absolutely link to the government of Kazakhstan. So let's talk a little bit more about these guys. Uh, leaked emails published by Kazaword uh, alleged that the government of Kazakhstan had previously hired this company called uh, Arcanum to perform a surveillance and data extraction mission. Uh, it even had a code name. It was codenamed Raptor. You know it's serious business when you've got a code name. Uh, targeting Mr. Ablazov and his family. Uh, among the services offered by Arcanum are full spectrum cyber operations, which they describe using this language. Uh, here we go. Uh, when our government clients come under threat, Arcanum's global, Arcanum Global's embedded, uh, embedded specialists and capabilities support them with a full suite of response options, including in consummate with, a, with applicable laws and regulations, an array of countermeasures, as well as both in-kind and asymmetrical responses. Sounds a lot like hacking to me. It kind of sounds like hacking, yeah. Um, so uh, there's uh, strong evidence consistent with there being a link between Operation Manul and the government of Kazakhstan and between the government of Kazakhstan and Arcanum. However, uh, the direct links between Operation Manul and Arcanum are not really there. Instead, we think it's some other guys. So we wanted to look into whether this attack might be related to any known APT actors. Um, and 
what we found were links, so, okay, so we looked through lists of known APT infrastructure, and we found links to a campaign called Operation Hangover. From this, we were able to observe overlaps between Operation Hangover, or Operation Mantle, and an actor known as Apin. Apin is an Indian company that allegedly provides offensive cyber capability on a contract basis. Uh, a 2013 report by the cybersecurity firm Norman Shark, titled Operation Hangover, unveiling an Indian cyber, in cyber attack infrastructure, described multiple campaigns linked to APIN. The campaigns included attacks on Punjabi separatists, Norwegian telecom company Telenor, and multiple other companies. Uh, APIN denies that they do any hacking for hire, though they do have an ethical hacker training, and a number of different campaigns have been linked to them. Uh, according to documents that were filed by lawyers representing the Abdiazov family in a Swiss court, several of the samples linked to this campaign were variants of the hackback Trojan. In, uh, we were unable to find these samples, so we're lying on this legal document. Interestingly, though, similar malware in the hackback family was found on an Angolan activist computer in the 2013 Oslo Freedom Festival. This attack was also attributed to Appen by ESET and Norman Security, Norman Shark. What's more, an analysis carried out by the Swiss police on the samples that we've linked to Operation Mantle, they were able to trace several of the emails back to IP addresses which are located in New Delhi. In fact, it's worth noting that all of the emails which they were able to trace linked back to addresses in Indian IP space. But, oh, <laughs> but we can't do it just on that alone. We also found a number of a bunch of overlapping infrastructure with Operation Hangover. So here are all the domains that overlap between Operation Mantle and Operation Hangover. Appen is an exceptionally noisy actor, uh, which might be expected given the supposed contract nature of their work. What? Whoa, it's gone. Oh, there it is. Um, prior research revealed 607 domains linked to APIN, which we were able to link via historical DNS from passive total to 1,300 IP addresses. Of those, there were direct overlaps for two of the operation mental domains, meaning that two of the operation mental domains were on the same IP addresses at the same time as operation uh, hangover domains. There were also indirect overlaps with 110 of the operation hangover domains, meaning same IP addresses, different times, and all but two of the domains which were associated with Operation Mantle. Uh, and here highlighted in red are the two domains which overlapped between Operation Mantle and Operation Hangover. Uh, it's also worth noting this domain which is highlighted in black, appinsecurity.com, which was linked to Operation Hangover. Appinsecurity.com narrowly missed overlapping with uh, Adobe Air.net, which is one of the domains in Operation Mantle, by just five days. So I think that's worth noting. Of course, none of this is conclusive, right? We can't be certain that it was Apin. It could have been another actor who looks a lot like Apin. It could have been somebody who bought Apin's infrastructure. It could have been aliens. Maybe it was China. But we think, based on the evidence that we have, that it was likely to be APIN working with the Kazakhstan government. So, what does it all mean? I see you've left me the hard part. Let's talk a little bit about what this all means, what the takeaways are from, uh, from this sort of campaign. Uh, I think really one of the most important points to keep in mind is this. This is why you haven't seen report after report about people targeting uh, dissidents in Kazakhstan or misdeeds by the government of Kazakhstan. I think that when security researchers see uh, relatively unsophisticated targeting such as this from a state that doesn't normally get a lot of attention, they just sort of yawn and, uh, and scroll down because who even knows where Kazakhstan is? Except for you guys because you were paying attention during the map at the beginning which I appreciate. Um, the other thing that I think is very important to keep in mind is that more research is needed. Uh, 
Cooper and I, uh, and indeed the, the four authors of this paper, are a very small crew. Uh, most of us have no you know, real affiliation with uh, like big players in the security industry. Uh, we are able to do this on our own, and I'm fairly certain that Cooper and I are less good at this than many of the people who are in this room right now. Uh, so I beg you to go look at our report and see the many loose ends that we have left, the many areas in which more research is needed. Uh, it would not be that difficult for people with more skills than us and more resources than us uh, to be helpful, just saying. Um, the other important lesson that I think, it, uh, that I think is a really key takeaway is uh, that attacks do not have to be sophisticated in order to work. Uh, most of these attacks are pretty like bog standard spear phishing attacks, trying to convince people to click malicious links or open malicious documents. Uh, governments uh, in, this, in this situation are very rarely using O'Day, uh, especially the government of Kazakhstan. We have not documented a single instance of the use of O'Day in this campaign. Uh, sometimes they are not even using particularly sophisticated rats. Uh, we've also learned that governments are not monolithic. Uh, we're learning that they can take a mixed approach to surveillance. Uh, in the case of Kazakhstan, this is a country that has uh, both hacking team and Finn Fisher's software, and here what we have is a very strong possibility that they still hired some guys in India to do some work for them. Uh, having said all that, um, even though attacks don't need to be sophisticated in order to be effective, the targeting that we see is sophisticated. Uh, these are people who definitely know who their targets are and understand what it is that's going to interest them. So if you want to target people who are, uh, who are all opposed to the government of Kazakhstan, you say, hey, open this report, open this uh, document pertaining to your legal case. If you want uh, an activist for the Electronic Frontier Foundation to open your document, you just uh, invite them to a conference and you offer them free flights and hotels. So uh, my colleague Morgan marquis Bois and I uh, have been doing this work for a very long time, and we thought it would be a really good idea to get more people in the security uh, industry involved. Uh, and so we embarked on this campaign, uh, which we nicknamed uh, You Can Be Heroes, because we like David Bowie. Uh, we, we felt that this kind of work was very often overlooked because it's not technically sophisticated, but it could actually have a great deal of political impact. Um, we discovered that there were a lot of reversers who were interested in helping, but that integrating them into our workflow proved to be quite difficult. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why. It's not every day that you get up in front of an audience of a whole lot of people and you explain to them why something that you did for two years failed. Uh, so here, here is kind of what we do. Uh, we do outreach to the community. We do trust building. It's really hard to get people to hand over their devices to you to see whether or not they've been owned, uh, if they've just met you or if they've never heard of you. Often they need to meet you in person. Sometimes they need to meet you in really obscure places. Sometimes they need to spend some time really getting to know you before you can make any kind of progress in this area. Uh, we also do incident response, malware analysis, forensics, threat intel, you know, the kind of stuff that people in this room really enjoy. Uh, we do a lot of education and training and IT support and help desk as sort of basic hand-holding where somebody sends you an email and they go, so is this a phishing attack? And then you explain to them that, yes, this is ransomware, but it's probably just very boring ransomware. Uh, next, we also do some policy research. Uh, we uh, legal research and some uh, work with law enforcement. Uh, which is a, a very small part of our work. Uh, we do advocacy, awareness, uh, we push for policy change. Uh, if we start seeing patterns in the way that uh, activists or journalists are being attacked, we try to encourage, uh, say, NGOs or media companies uh, to uh, improve their, uh, their security stance, to have, like, I don't know, any kind of security posture at all would probably be a good start. Uh, and then finally, uh, we do follow up with the other affected parties. And sometimes that means, you know, sinkholing a domain. And sometimes it means uh, sitting down with an activist and reinstalling everything on their computer from a backup. Because when an activist has been owned, uh, security researchers usually just want to get their hands on the sample. I know I do. Um, but what the, what the activist really wants to know is, is it safe to use their device again? So what we discovered over the course of this work is that we do all of this stuff 
Um, but that security researchers are mostly interested in doing the malware analysis. Uh, these are malware analysts. They want to do what they're good at, and I can't blame them. Um, so uh, it turns out there's actually very little malware analysis to be done. Uh, it can't really be uh, broken up into the sort of like two or three hour chunks, and that's part of what makes collaboration tricky. So we have a few ideas about how to make this kind of collaboration better, uh, which I have, of course, titled What is to be Done. Uh, there are a few things that industry can do. Uh, it would be really nice. Uh, industry is in a, a unique position uh, to see a really wide variety of attacks, so we think that it would be cool if they uh, told users when they were being uh, uh, targeted by uh, state actors. Um, we also really want those warnings to be useful. I'm looking at you, Twitter, and your weird warning in which you warned people that the way to deal with being fished by a government was to use Tor. Uh, last of all, I think it would be a really good idea if, uh, in order to develop a desire to do all the other parts of this, uh, of this messy, messy work, uh, it is a good idea to choose an organization that you really care about where you want to make a difference. And uh, if you have particular interests, um, I would be happy to come talk to you after this talk and sort of pair you up with, a, with an organization in a sort of big brother, big sister kind of way. Uh, one thing that uh, security researchers should understand is that these organizations will not necessarily hail you as a magical rock star unicorn, which is a pity because you are. Um, but it might take them a long time. They might not even know what you do, but if you're willing to do uh, some of these other bits of the work, they will eventually come to understand your value and you can uh, make a tremendous difference. So, let us recap. None of this research is sexy. I do not do sexy research. Cooper does not do sexy research. The tools and the actors, not very sophisticated. They wear white shoes after Labor Day. <laughs> Attacks don't have to be sophisticated to work. These people are not using any O-days, but it still works, man. Uh, and last of all, uh, it's not every day that malware research uh, can really make a difference in people's lives. Uh, if, uh, if you help to protect these people, you can help to prevent kidnappings. You can help to prevent uh, fire bombings. You can definitely make their lives so much better and so much easier. So please keep in mind the political ramifications of work that is otherwise not very technically complicated. Thank you. So we have about five, four probably now minutes for questions. Uh, and also just a huge thanks again to Morgan Marky Bohr and Claudio Guarnieri, our fellow researchers in this. Couldn't have done this without them. Thanks to Operation Hangover researchers, uh, Hex Rays, Joe Sandbox, Virus Total for donations of their products and all of our colleagues at EFF. So I don't know, is there a lineup for questions or is there just, I guess just there, there's microphones at the back? in the aisles. So if you have a question, come out to the aisle, get on that microphone, shout it out. No? Maybe there are no questions. Maybe we have answered all the questions. All right. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All done. <laughs>